and CEO of the Fox Cities Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the second community briefing in our new Healthy Fox City series. I want to acknowledge that today is Giving Tuesday. Thank you for getting out there and giving generously in our community. Our first briefing, Healthy Holidays, was an awesome learning opportunity. And today we're talking about the road ahead, a topic I think is on everyone's mind as we go into cold and flu season with COVID-19 on the rise. And we try and look at what changes may be on the horizon for 2021. As always, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Ascension Wisconsin. Ascension is on the front lines of this pandemic, and having their partnership to bring you these briefings is absolutely invaluable. Thank you, Ascension. The format of today's event will be some brief reports from our panelists. We have three great speakers today, and then around 1230, we will open it up for discussion and questions. If you'd like to ask our panelists a question, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit it, not the chat feature. You can start submitting your questions now or at any point in our conversation this afternoon. I also want to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and will be available to view as a rebroadcast on the Fox Cities Chamber of Commerce website. I also want to give everyone a heads up that our next panel briefing will be Thursday, December 10th at noon. The topic will be reaching out. Stay tuned to our Fox Cities Chamber of Commerce website for all of the latest information as well as links to register. We are committed to these panel discussions always being free and open to the public. With that, I'd like to welcome today's panel. Speaking today in this order will be Dr. Tom Nichols, who is the Vice President for Medical Affairs at Ascension St. Elizabeth, as well as Surge Section Chief for Ascension Wisconsin. Second, Dr. Mark Cockley, who is the Chief Clinical Officer at ThetaCare, and third, Doug Guerin, Director of Winnebago County Health Department. Dr. Nichols, I'll turn it over to you first. I know you have firsthand knowledge of how this pandemic has been affecting and will continue to affect our healthcare workforce in the Fox Cities. When we talk about the road ahead, it really is important to keep these frontline heroes at the top of our minds, isn't it, Dr. Nichols? Thanks, Becky. Uh, I, I will share a few things. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we got here, um, how Ascension Wisconsin is responding, and then touch a little bit on the road ahead and some challenges and reasons for optimism. Um, so Ascension Wisconsin has 24 facilities in, in the state, and we have been, uh, like all other health systems, managing this since, uh, since March, really. Um, what we have done is tried initially to ramp up our capabilities as a hospital through acquiring equipment, uh, acquiring extra bed spaces, planning for this surge that didn't happen in spring, but did happen uh, with a bang this fall. Uh, when the surge finally did hit the Fox Cities area, what we and the other health systems found is that it wasn't the bed spaces, the ventilators, or some of those other things that we were anticipating being the the pinch points early on that that we were uh, hardest hit, it was our staff. So the combination of having staff who were exposed in the community, just like everybody else uh, in the community, as those, uh, as those COVID uh, infections started to rise in the community, we saw a corresponding rise in our healthcare workers. And I, I think it's safe to say that <clears throat> all the healthcare systems saw the same thing. And that combination of seeing the highest volumes of COVID patients, along with having the higher numbers of staff absenteeism, uh, really created some, some challenges for the healthcare system to meet the needs of the community. We have been able to respond, and, and part of the uh, benefit of being with a large national healthcare system is we were able to bring in staff from other parts of the country when we were surging. Um, but I think one of the things that we have found um, is, is that's not a, limit, a limited or a limitless resource. So we have been able to have healthcare workers come from other parts of the state and from other parts of the country to help us out. Uh, as the other parts of the state surged and as other parts of the country surged, those resources uh, are starting to become more scarce. The other way that, that we've responded is um, by having staff pick up extra hours or by having staff 
um, stop what they're doing in other areas of the health system, help out in the hospital. That is also not an infinite resource. Uh, the, the healthcare workers, you, you mentioned um, that they're heroes, and, and I would agree with you, I view them that way. But if you ask any healthcare worker right now if they view themselves as a hero, they, they, they kind of bristle at that term. Um, and, and I've talked to them about why, and I think there's a few reasons. Uh, one is calling them a hero or a superhero, it implies they have superpowers, and, and they really don't. They're humans just like the rest of us, and they're tired. Um, they, they don't have a cape that they can take off when they go home. When they go home, uh, they have to attend to their families and they have to um, buy groceries and do their bills and all the other things that all the rest of us do. Um, but then they come to work and their shifts are hard. Uh, they're physically hard and they're emotionally hard. Uh, for every patient that they go in to see, they have to do a complex uh, procedure to ensure they have all the right safety equipment on. It takes several minutes to put that equipment on. The equipment's very uncomfortable. And then they have to go and see a patient who can't have visitors, um, maybe uh, afraid of dying. And that nurse may be that person's primary uh, contact point or really become their, their surrogate family while they're in the hospital. So that, that physical and emotional toll, along with working those extra hours uh, uh, is, is taxing on the healthcare workers. And that's, that's really some of the, um, the human cost that we're seeing in the hospital is, is just that impact on our healthcare workers. So they, they uh, I think, would prefer that we stop calling them heroes and start honoring the work that they're doing by taking action in the community to try to reduce some of the infections that we're seeing in the community. I think some of the things that we've seen is, is people referring to this as an old person's disease. And it, it's true that the, um, the, the people over 65 and the people that are, have underlying healthcare concerns are those that are, have been most um, greatly impacted from a mortality standpoint. Um, but what we've also seen is that uh, it's oftentimes the young people who are uh, not necessarily as, as physically harmed, although they can be, with the infection that, that are potentially driving the infection into the communities and around the communities and to our most vulnerable people that aren't able to completely protect themselves from all contacts. So when we saw our first surge here um, around Labor Day, we saw a large spike in the number of cases in people in their 20s and 30s. And about two weeks later, we saw a spike in cases uh, in every other age group in the state. And so I think that underscores that the mobility of some people um, may be greater than the the individual health impact on themselves that they face, but does present a greater health impact on the population. Uh, so if we had a message, it would be to take this seriously um, and to realize that it's not just yourself that is impacted if you um, are, are to come across this, in, uh, this virus. In, in terms of what we're seeing right now, uh, we get a lot of questions about what is your capacity and capacity is, is not a fixed number. It's not that we can say we have X number of beds every day because capacity is dependent on having the physical beds, the equipment, and also the healthcare staff. Uh, and so that number changes from day to day. But what most health systems find is that on a typical day pre-COVID, they run at 80 to 90% of their staffed bed capacity. And right now we're seeing um, hundreds of additional patients uh, with COVID. Across Ascension, Wisconsin, we got up to a peak of around 360 patients hospitalized with COVID. I think today we are at 270, 280. So we are down a little bit from our peak numbers, but still that's an incredibly high number of patients that we have to accommodate within our healthcare systems without really a, a lot more resources to take care of those patients. And that does sometimes have a trickle-down effect on the ability to take care of patients with other healthcare needs. Um, so we've had elective surgeries that had to be postponed or other uh, impacts to some of the services that we can provide. And we're still able to provide for emergency services and, and take on most of the healthcare needs. But I think the concern that we would have is over the next few months, as people are increasingly indoors, uh, we have holidays coming up, 
that the, um, the number of infections and the impact on our healthcare system could be well beyond what we saw in the last peak a couple of weeks ago. And so um, that, that would be the message is that we're not through the worst of it. Uh, we're not through the end of it. Um, but I do think there are better times ahead. I think the vaccine data that we've seen uh, and that um, will be talked about later is very promising. And so if we can maintain some of these uh, social distancing recommendations, if we can keep the numbers in our communities at a manageable level for the next few months until those, uh, vir uh, until those vaccines start to become more widely circulated, uh, then our, our communities will be able to, to weather this storm. Thank you so much, Dr. Nichols. We, re we really appreciate your perspective. Um, for another medical view, I want to turn next to Dr. Mark Cockley, the Chief Clinical Officer at ThetaCare. Dr. Cockley, thank you so much for being here today to talk about what you and your colleagues are saying on the ground and in our hospitals. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, I think probably a lot of the things that Dr. Nichols said are very similar that ThetaCare and, and our hospitals and communities is, is, is facing. You know, really, you know, we see a little bit of a, a break since the holiday and some of the numbers dropping a little bit or plateauing at least, a little bit less in the hospital, but I still think it's, it's very serious and we need to continue doing what we've been doing to help prevent the spread of the virus. You know, recently the test, you know, on Monday had only about 2,500 positive tests, um, but again, it was probably one of the lower testing days in, in a while um, with about 29% of the tests being positive which is still lower than the seven day average of 35%, which has been going on and a low seven day average of 4,200 tests. So a uh, test positive. So I think we're doing well in that, that aspect of the tests and the positivity rate in our community. Um, some of these numbers are, are kind of along the lines where it was in the beginning of October and it's been that long since we've been down the slow. So it's been, you know, most of the month of October, all of November and starting off in December now, as Dr. Nichols says, that it's really been straining in, in the healthcare providers and the, the nurses, the hospital staff have been really stretched to, to the capacity. Um, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs on a daily basis. Um, you know, really what is going to come up from the holiday weekend, we, we still have, have time to figure that out. Um, you know, it, it can take, you know, five to seven days before people get positive. And like Dr. Nichols said, it's, you know, that first wave gets positive, then who's that next wave they infect. So there's a lot to come. And then in the middle of that, we have Christmas coming up. So um, we lot need to keep going and, and uh, monitoring the system, what's going on, keep our social distancing, washing our hands. Um, you know, looking at statewide overall, there's still about 1,800 people uh, in, in uh, hospital due to COVID and 398 people in the ICUs throughout the state. Um, this again has dropped down below 500 or 400 for the first time since November 9th. So looking at, you know, statewide over 400 people in the ICU due to COVID um, for well over a month um, or close to a month at least. So it's, you know, um, you know, it's really putting strain on the, in the hospital systems. Um, you know, you heard that there's an the alternative care facility that set up in the state fairgrounds um, that was set up, uh, you know, several weeks ago. Right now, they're down to census of about six people. So, you know, kind of good that you know, that overflow is seeing a little bit of relief, meaning we have a little bit more beds in the hospital. We're not needing to use that uh, as a care site as much recently. Um, but, you know, things can change and uh, more to be learned. In the eight county area, there's about 111 COVID patients uh, in the Fox Valley region that's hospitalized, 21 of those in the ICU. Um, and there's about 10 to 12 ICU beds open right now in the region. And again, this varies on, on a day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour basis. You know, we all look, um, re, you know, every day to say, you know, who's there? How can we move people out? What's that next level of care to get to? You know, it goes from the ICU to the general medicine floors. And then really getting people out of the hospital has been a challenge with the COVID cases that have been in the skilled nursing facilities. So people who don't meet uh, care needs for the hospital can't get to that next lower level of care out in skilled nursing facilities because of the um, COVID cases that hit there or they need to be tested and can't admit for a week because they have to get a week's worth of tests. So that's kind of some of the day-to-day -day things that are going on in the hospital. 
Um, right now, the other thing that's kind of coming up and we've got to be attention to is influenza season. Season starts in September, kind of builds through October, November, kind of peaks in January, February. So we've got to be careful that, hey, influenza is around. You can get COVID and influenza at the same time. The symptoms are very sim similar, starting off with fever, chills, cough, difficulty breathing. So really on symptom basis, you can't tell the difference. So it's important to get the seasonal influenza vaccination and it's recommended for anyone of six months of age or older. So that can really decrease your risk of getting influenza or significant illness from that. Um, but really testing is the main problems uh, way to determine. So if you start having symptoms, um, you need to get tested. More than likely now you're gonna get tested for COVID and influenza, try to different, differentiate what's there. Uh, most people who get influenza do recover over the you know, week to 10 day period, um, but both can have similar complications, whether it's pneumonia, uh, respiratory failure, uh, sepsis, extended period of time in the hospital. So neither of them are, are to be taken lightly. And that's one reason why we do the influenza vaccine, uh, that we have that um, way to prevent the disease or prevent se severe disease. And yes, there are some COVID, COVID vaccinations coming out and we'll be working rapidly to try to deploy those also. Um, you know, all the other thing is that make sure, you know, just because you had the flu vaccine, that's not going to cover um, COVID because it's a different virus, a different process. So one will not cover the other. One way, though, that you can help with both of those is really with the social distancing, wearing masks, hand washing, um, and, and doing those, avoiding contact, you know, keeping in the household where you have just the known contacts and not people coming over um, and cleaning surfaces frequently. Both of the, all that stuff works well to prevent influenza. I think this last spring when all the COVID was coming around, people started distancing themselves. We did see a decrease in the influenza throughout the community. So that's important there. Um, just really need to keep continuing to be safe. Really, um, you know, Dr. Nicholson and I are in, um, um, also from Aurora, the CMOs and the leaders there were on uh, connection uh, fairly frequently and keep each other updated. We, you know, text message back and forth so we know what's going on. Again, I think Dr. Nichols pointed out, we have uh, optimized some of our opportunities through the hospital as far as capacity. What we want to do is make sure we have the ability to care for the community for all their needs. Um, you need to go to the hospital if you think you're having chest pain and heart related problems, or if you think you have a stroke, there's not a reason not to go to the hospital and you need to go to the emergency department as soon as you can to get those treatments. There's been a lot of things going on that we've done to keep people safe, keep employees safe, keep patients safe. You know, if you look at the, uh, throughout data care, the number of staff that have become infected with COVID, majority of them have been from community acquired. Less than 1% of our COVID positive cases employees are from work exposure. 99% of them are from, uh, uh, from uh, the ambulatory uh, ca catching it in the community. One reason why we want to keep COVID less in the community helps protect the healthcare workers who can then be there to serve us, but also so less spread in the community so we less uh, not overtax them as much with the uh, burden of illness. Help to keep the, the hospital open, obviously working through that throughput, trying to get people through uh, in a quick fashion, take care of their conditions and get them out of the hospital. Um, also the, some of the elective procedures, we've also worked with our surgical partners, any of those elective surgeries which they feel can be delayed a little bit without patient harm, they have. And what we do is on a daily or weekly basis, kind of adjust the surgical schedule to get more people in when we have more beds open. When the beds become tighter, kind of ratchet it down to those more urgent or needed surgeries um, to get through, making sure we still have the capacity to care for all those urgent cases. Um, you know, one thing is testing is very important. There is a testing site on the Green Bay Road and, and at the, uh, in Nina for um, people to be tested as a drive-through. You don't need to have an appointment. It, it is preferred, um, but you can go to ThetaCare. Uh, COVID19.org to find all the testing sites. To go to that other site, um, um, you can register there. If you're under 18, there needs to be a parent or guardian with you, and they do have a website or a call you for the test results. The importance of having the test testing done, if you think you have symptoms or think you be, have been exposed, is to know if you have COVID. Many people don't have symptoms early on, 
but you want to be able to isolate, be able to prevent that spread to other people, let the Department of Health know that you've been positive so they can do the contact tracing to help reduce the um, possible spread to other people. So it's very important to know and get those tested. Again, don't delay care if you need care. If you think you have symptoms and they're mild, contact your, your primary care doctor so they can help you determine what that level of care is need, help, so they can help you monitor and determine if you're safe to stay home and isolate or your symptoms getting worse and do you need medical care. Again, uh, hospitals, and I know Ascension is doing this very well also, is the, you know, the mask, the screening of visitors in the hospital, protecting those that are in the hospital, protecting the workers in the hospital. Uh, we'll make sure we have our appropriate PPE and plenty to, to last as, as we go. Um, so it's very important. And I think this is, you know, kind of settings like this to spread the information is, is very important to, to get through, um, you know, working with Ascension, Be Safe Wisconsin, to help make sure we're taking care of our community, delivering the, commu the care they need um, locally is, is very important. Uh, really the only way we can continue to change and make good progress is to do the things that we know work, wearing the mask, uh, social distancing, avoiding large gatherings, um, washing your hands, and then you know, we can continue to get th through this together. I think a lot of great things have been done, a lot of great learnings, a lot of great teamwork, a lot of collaboration between the healthcare systems to do what we need for our communities. So, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Coakley. Uh, Coakley, I'm sorry. Um, the information that you and Dr. Nichols have shared is just amazing. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, we're privileged today to be joined by the director of the Winnebago County Health Department, Doug Guerin. Doug, you and your team have done such a tremendous job communicating in our community, which is hard because of all of the counties and municipalities involved. But if we're, but if we're united as the Fox Cities, we have to work together to see the light at the end of the tunnel, don't we? Thank you yes, so did. much, Doug. I'll hand it over to you. Very good. Thank you. And, and, and yes, we do. We, and actually, public health works you know, very well together, much like the uh, hospital systems. Um, you know, we've got good relationships and um, we share information. We meet on a very regular basis uh, to share. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll share the Winnebago County perspective. Um, you know, there'll be much overlap with uh, the other public health agencies that are in our area. Um, but, uh, but just note that it, I'm just really bringing it from our, our Winnebago County perspective here. Um, in the few minutes that we have left before we go to Q&A, I just want to give just a very quick overview of you know, what, what, what should you expect from your public health agency? What is your public health agency doing right now? Um, and, and I've got it's just a few buckets here just to, to run through to make sure everybody understands that role and, 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 and understand that your, your public health agencies have pretty much had a retool uh, in order to respond to this pandemic. Um, we don't have the staffing um, to run our operations as we normally would during this pandemic and we've really repurposed the majority of our staff to respond to this, in addition to adding a very large number of additional staff compared to our agency sizes uh, to respond to this. And, and really, when you think about communicable disease from a public health perspective, it's really about, you know, how do we prevent spread? Um, um, how do we find that source? How do we stop this illness? And, and in this case, you know, we're, we're dealing with a very difficult disease. Um, you know, I, I, I think about pertussis when I think about COVID and that it's really, it's contagious before you have symptoms and it's most contagious very early in the illness. And so it's really difficult to stop spread if you're not being careful, which is why, you know, the masking and the social distancing are so important because by the time you realize that, that you have symptoms, if you're going to have them, it's too late. You may have infected someone else. And I really have, you know, uh, the, the goal that I want everyone to have is, um, you know, try not to infect someone else. If, if everybody has the, the mindset of, you know, your goal in COVID personally is just not to give it to someone else, um, we can really reduce infections. And, and you can only do that by, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, you're, you're in safe environments, um, that you're not putting yourself at risk, that you're using masks, that um, you're, you're distancing yourself, and, um, and, and that you're just aware all the time that even if you're asymptomatic, you have that potential. And so if you have a risky family member, for instance, um, and, and by risky, I mean someone that is out in the community a lot or is traveling, um, even wearing masks at home is really advisable, especially if you have sensitive individuals at home. Um, but um, back to, to, our, to our buckets here. So, the, you know, first line of defense is getting those disease reports. 
and then uh, and doing contact investigations. We can stop spread uh, if, we, if people know that they've become infected. So um, our, our goal is to reach out you know, within 24 hours to everyone that's been, that has a positive test. And unfortunately, because of testing availability um, and laboratory capacity, sometimes that takes days for us to get. And, and so now someone has been infected, tests positive, and it's a few days before we can get to them. Another reason that it's really important for people to be on alert all the time. Um, you know, we've, we've added, um, you know, uh, almost as many staff as we have in our agency just to help out with contact tracing. And, um, and, and we can do those notifications, but the contact investigations, frankly, have overwhelmed public health departments uh, with the capacity that they have. So we have enlisted uh, and asked for the support of the public in, in doing contact investigations. We reach out to all those high risk ones. Um, uh, the ones that um, are, are in group housing situations, um, other areas where we, we feel that there are a lot of people that are immediately at risk. Uh, the rest, we're asking you know, for people to support us and, and we support them by putting a lot of information out um, on our website. Um, we do daily reports on our website. You can subscribe um, uh, to our feed. We do a weekly summary so that people can kind of get the bigger, higher picture level. Um, and then we do a bunch on social media uh, and, and those are all things that you can follow. And, and you can do that for each of uh, your, your health departments and in, in, in the jurisdiction that you live in. Um, the, other, um, the other part of a follow-up with uh, contact investigations is are those recommendations on isolation and quarantine. Um, it's really important to, to follow those. Um, you know, when, when, and it's unfortunate that, you know, being a contact to a case requires a 14-day quarantine. And when you're sick, it only requires a 10-day isolation. Um, it, um, you know, that, that definitely, you know, complicates the issue a little bit, but it's so important to heed those uh, and to stay home. Uh, when you've been exposed, it can be up to 14 days before you actually develop symptoms. And, uh, and we really want to make sure that um, we protect the rest of your family and the public uh, when you've been exposed or, or deemed a close contact to someone. And then, of course, obviously staying home when you, when you have a case, because remember, those first days are the most infectious but you're really infectious through that whole, almost that whole 10 day period. So um, another area that we work on uh, besides communications um, and, and, and our contact investigations is, is testing. And public health doesn't really do testing, so to speak, but they try to provide um, an assurance of availability of testing. Uh, and so you saw a, a big ramp up in the testing sites. We had a big help from the National Guard. Um, we've had HHS sites, Data Care has done, done, a, done a great job bringing that site in, UWO as part of the UW system has brought testing in um, and we'll continue to hopefully see testing expand. Right now we're working on, you know, what is, is the end of uh, what we were expecting that the end of the Wisconsin National Guard or, or wing as we call them um, to help support us. Uh, we're currently working with the state and the state's currently working with the feds about how do we extend that the best way that we can so that we don't have a testing gap. Um, uh, we need uh, both healthcare providers and community testing sites in order to really support the community. With our high positivity rates, as, as, as Dr. Cockley pointed out, you, unless, until we're down below 5% or even less than that, really we don't have enough testing. And, uh, and so we are, while testing is available, um, it's probably not being utilized to the extent that we can. We understand that some people just don't wanna know. This, you know, it impacts your life. And but we really encourage, in order to knock this down, you've gotta get tested. The knowledge is power and um, you can protect your families and, and your community by making sure that you get tested when you feel like you've had an exposure. It doesn't require you know, somebody telling you to go to that test site. If, if you were found yourself in a situation, it, the holiday weekend's a perfect example. If you traveled, go get tested. Um, it's, you know, you've put yourself out in public and um, you may have contacted uh, illness. And, and, and if you have, it's important to make sure that you test at the right time. Um, if you've had an exposure to someone that's positive um, or you feel that you have, we really want you to wait four or five days minimum before you get tested. But that also means staying home, uh, staying home and staying away from others until you actually get tested and you get those test results. That's difficult, but that's what's gonna help stop the spread of the disease. We are at a very, very high level of illness uh, in, in our communities. We are at the highest level by DHS. Wisconsin is one of the highest case rate states in the nation has been for a, quite a while um, and, uh, and and we're really not doing well and knocking it down. We've reached a very high level and now we're plateaued out there and, and, and in our data and it's important to 
to, to note that with testing strategies changing a bit here, we've had our PCR tests, uh, which are the tests that most everybody's had, and, and it takes a few days to get those test results. You know, we're, we're gradually moving towards more rapid testing, and that means antigen testing. And, um, and so the UWO site has, has antigen testing. You can get a result in, in 15 to 20 minutes. Those occasionally require a follow-up PCR test, but for symptomatic individuals, that PCR test can confirm right away that you do have COVID, and it's a, and it's a good test for that. So if you're symptomatic, seeking that, that the antigen test is, is helpful. Um, and what we're having to do is adjust our data a little bit. And so when you look at our, at our dashboards at the public health agencies, it's important to note that now we're starting to, to take a look at those confirmed cases and those probable cases, because an antigen test can only be a probable uh, case. And so we're starting to combine those numbers so that you can really see as, as testing shifts um, what the true burden of uh, those positive test results are. And so, you know, right now we're seeing a little bit of a downward trend in testing because it's largely the, the results of that and the reporting on that is largely from PCR testing. Um, if you add in that antigen testing that's occurring now, um, you'll, you'll see that at least for us in Winnebago County, you know, while our PCR numbers have gone down, um, the antigen tests keep us flat. And so we're really not declining in terms of our burden of disease when you factor that in. And then lastly, um, um, vaccination planning. And, you know, obviously that's something that's ramping up considerably right now. And I expect that we'll talk a little bit more about that here on this call today. Um, you know, some big decisions being made today. Um, you know, we're this, this first phase of, of vaccination rollout, you know, we call phase 1A. Um, very limited amount of vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna uh, that are, are going to be coming out. Really probably only the Pfizer vaccine may be available yet this year. Um, we have um, uh, the FDA has yet to approve uh, either of those vaccines. Uh, they're meeting later this month, uh, I believe on the 10th and the 17th, to to take a look at those vaccines. But as soon as there is an emergency use authorization granted by FDA, um, the, the vaccine that's available from those companies should start to roll right away. Um, there are some, uh, some pretty heavy uh, restrictions and cold chain uh, um, requirements uh, for the initial Pfizer vaccine. Those vaccines are going to largely go to group health um, uh, group housing situations, high-risk individuals, and or healthcare providers. And those are the decisions that are being made today um, at the state level and at the federal level in terms of priorities. Um, and then keeping in mind that, you know, we'll have very limited vaccine available yet this year, um, you know, somewhere in the order of, you know, 10 to 20 million doses. That's not enough to cover those high-priority groups um, across the United States uh, where, where, you know, we have a population of, you know, over 330 million. Um, uh, we're going to have to be patient. Uh, we're going to need to keep going with the masking and distancing for a number of months. Um, uh, we're not going to have vaccine for the masses, so to speak, really until probably the, the second quarter or, or summer of, of next year where we can uh, vaccinate very large numbers of people and, and really knock this down and end the pandemic as we know it. We won't be ending COVID, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll be very likely ending the pandemic. So. Um, with that and, and recognizing our time, let's, we can certainly go to questions. Thank you very much, Doug. At this time, we're going to open up the discussion for additional questions. Just a reminder, if you want to ask any or all of our panelists a question, please type it in the Q&A box, and we'll be happy to pass it along. I'm going to take a look in the queue right now, but I know it's not too, but no, it's not too late to submit a question if you have one. We have moderators look at the Q&A as we speak, and let's see if our first question is there now. We have our first question in the panel for, for the panel, and some of this has been addressed in the remarks. How are the healthcare systems, both metro and rural, collaborating to get through this? And are there instances where collaborations can continue to provide more effective healthcare in our community? I can start there if, if you like. Um, so I, I would say both within our system and in between systems that's been occurring from the start. So with the Ascension, I mentioned we have a number of facilities across the state, both in rural areas and in urban areas down in Milwaukee. Uh, we meet on a daily basis uh, with the leaders of this um, every site, uh, seven days a week to go over the, the hospitalized patients the number of available beds um, and any resource constraints that we have at any of our sites uh, each day so that we know if one site is really struggling to keep up that there's other sites nearby that can hopefully 
uh, share some resources or take some, some transfers of patients. Uh, that's really been the only way we would have been able to manage this. Uh, managing it alone would be a, a huge challenge. Um, and then as Mark mentioned, uh, between the systems, we collaborate regularly. We, we decided early on that uh, any competitiveness that exists between uh, the healthcare systems is gonna be put aside for the pandemic. And um, it's, it's really been great to work with Mark and uh, Dr. Newman from Aurora and other healthcare uh, systems throughout the state to find ways that we can cooperate to best meet the healthcare needs of the community uh, during this time. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, I'd agree. You know, Tom and I, we've had a lot of great discussions, even early on, on how to plan for this. How do we do surgeries? How do we approach the docs? How do we make sure we have uh, access in our facilities and, and, you know, we're doing the right things for the community? Um, we have, you know, discussions with our, our, all our hospitals each day also and make sure that each of the local critical access areas have a bed availability you know, for people that would come in. So each day moving people around, admitting maybe to hospital a little bit further distance from where you're at so we can maintain those overnight beds so you don't have a crunch in the middle of the night when staffing's less. Um, staffing's moving around. I know Tom mentioned that also, you know, moving staff around to help where that need is too is, is something we've done quite a bit. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Doug and it's about vaccines. When the vaccine is available, how will it be distributed and who makes up those high priority groups you mentioned that should receive it first? Yep, great question. Um, you know, we're figuring that out as we go right now. Uh, we still don't know for sure when vaccine is gonna be available. We anticipate uh, shortly after uh, the FDA meets to, to give the emergency use, uh, use authorizations or EUAs that you might have heard about. Um, and we would anticipate that would be, you know, probably around the middle of the month uh, to the third week of the month. Um, the um, that Pfizer vaccine, which would be the first one, would be approved. Um, has really high cold chain requirements. So that it re really requires to be kept in a freezer, um, uh, and not the kind of freezer that you would normally see. We're talking, you know, laboratory research grade, you know, minus 80 uh, degree freezers that are really uncommon. And so we've been working with the state to, you know, inventory where those are. Uh, to make sure that we can get vaccine out and, and, and get it stationed. Uh, that vaccine um, is good when it's unfrozen for, for several days, uh, which is uh, helpful in terms of administration. And, and fortunately right now, since we don't really have a big vaccine infrastructure set up yet, that's happening right now so that uh, we can distribute lots of vaccine. Um, these initial doses are really going to be going to facilities that already have the capacity to administer. So group housing and healthcare. Um, and, and the decisions on that priority are, are, are being made shortly. So the Moderna vaccine uh, doesn't have quite the cold chain requirement that uh, Pfizer does. Um, it still needs to be kept quite cold, but um, it is uh, a little bit more forgiving. And we expect that, um, you know, there's in the pipeline, there are, I think there are about, a, uh, there's probably 12 or 13 vaccines right now that are in what, call, what are called phase three or phase two, where they're, we're doing testing those phase threes are the next ones that'll be up. And, and, and many of those, I think there's probably at least nine of them right now that are in phase three, including Pfizer and Moderna. Um, those are the ones that are being tested right now uh, with tens of thousands of people. Um, you know, those are administered out. Um, you know, people either, you know, get a vaccine or get a placebo. They're not told what. Um, and that's how these vaccines are being tested. And, and uh, the FDA is extremely serious about vaccine safety. We have uh, probably the safest vaccines available. There are, there are a couple of vaccines worldwide that have been approved already, um, um, but um, they, they likely would not meet the, the requirements the FDA has for safety. And we really wanna make sure this, this, this vaccine is safe before we roll it out. Oh, perfect. And the next question is for our, all of our panelists, and it is about kids. It has been reported that we are now starting to see more and more COVID-19 in children. And we got news last week that Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines have not been studied in children under 12. What should we expect with regards to protecting our children in 2021? I can, I can jump on that if you guys want. Um, the, um, there's, so there's a number of trials going on right now. I mentioned the phase three uh, pieces that are out. Um, and and we'll, while these initial vaccines will not be recommended for kids uh, because they haven't been tested in kids, um, it's likely that these um, um, 
the ones that are being studied right now will include larger and larger population sets such that by the time we have enough vaccine uh, for, uh, for virtually everyone, and especially those that are lower risk, like children and young adults, which will be the last to be vaccinated, that um, we'll, have, we'll have that information um, and, and on, on those vaccines and on how safe they are in those younger age groups. You might still be on mute. Yep. My apologies. <laughs> um, our, our building, the Chamber of Commerce right now is being sprayed and disinfected in the background, so I keep having to mute. Uh, can you speak about people being reinfected for a second time with COVID and how long someone is considered immune for? We have heard infections are worse the second time when people are reinfected. Yeah, you know, I've heard some people getting reinfected. I don't think we at, at Data Care have seen anyone locally that's that's been there. I think that's going to be a rare occurrence. Um, you know, early on, it may have been some people that were infected may have been a quote false positive because that is possible there. And so, if you said someone that had it now they got reinfected, you know, is that there? Um, you know, so I'm not clear on that. And I don't think there's a lot of good data. It's more incidental findings that this could have happened. I think right now the the thought is it's 90 days. So if you have an infection, you're good for 90 days. And others may have had some other data that may show a little bit longer, but I think that's kind of the recommendation that's there. Um, we're, as we're going and preparing for our vaccination and our plan, irrespective if you've had the COVID or not, that we would immunize everybody because there's not that data to show that long-term infect that um, protection. So we will plan on doing the immunization for everyone uh, as that comes out. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah, you. I would, Becky, I would, I would clarify one thing um, or add one thing to what Mark said, and that's that um, when people talk about getting reinfected, I think there's um, it's important to understand the way that we are uh, detecting infections. And so the, the main route that we detect infections is by a PCR test, which is looking for a DNA strand from the virus that causes COVID. It's an extremely sensitive test. So it doesn't take much DNA um, to be able to detect it. And it doesn't differentiate between DNA from a virus that's active and circulating versus DNA from a virus that's dead and just happens to be lingering there. So we have seen patients who have continued to test positive on, by PCR for two to three months after their infection. And so it, it's possible that a number of these people that are uh, uh, thinking that they have been reinfected are actually just continuing to test positive. And yeah. then the first or second infection is, is something besides COVID that's causing their symptoms, whether it's flu, allergies, any other virus. Um, and so I, th I think based on the worldwide studies, the, the risk of reinfection is relatively low uh, that we can uh, detect, but the risk of having a second positive is probably higher than that. Um, and then it's, I would agree with Mark that three months is, the, is what we use uh, functionally. So if somebody's gone longer than three months, uh, we would test them again before their surgery or if they had symptoms that could be COVID. Uh, but there has been some encouraging data that suggests that that immunity could last six months to two years. Um, but I think we just, nobody's had the infection for two years, so how could we know beyond that? But there, there are some encouraging signs that that immunity could last a little longer. Thank you both for that answer. And let's keep our fingers crossed that it's two years, right? Um, our next question is for Doug. What level of optimism do you have with the rollout of these vaccines? Do you believe a majority of people will eventually receive them? Do you expect any resistance to receiving the vaccines? Um, as has been mentioned, you know, our goal will be to vaccinate everyone that will take that vaccine. Um, we do know that there, um, you know, there's a percentage of the population that's going to remain very suspect and suspicious of the vaccine, despite. Um, you know, the, the links that the clinical trials go to and, and, and the uh, approval process. Um, the, uh, we're going to need, you know, seven to eight out of every 10 people probably in the end of this to really have a meaningful uh, slowdown um, of, of, the, of the virus. So, um, you know, we're going to do everything we can to, to share uh, information about those vaccines and their safety, uh, try to help assure the public that, that, that they are safe and that, you know, they, they shouldn't 
consider you know is this any differently than getting an annual uh, influenza vaccine and 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 we may you know we may find that um, that's actually what's necessary with COVID. We're going to be living with this for quite a while. Um, uh, so you know I'm 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 confident that the processes that are in place and the approval processes that are in place for these vaccines generate very safe vaccines. Um, will there be side, some side effects from vaccines? Yes, um, and you know I mean that may be just you know local site pain or you know maybe some ill feeling um, you know after that vaccination you know but typically those be gone within a day. The benefits um, certainly outweigh, um, you know, a, a temporary uh, in, inconvenience and, and how you're feeling um, as, as a result of, of, of getting a, a vaccination. Perfect. Uh, our next question is about antibody testing. Uh, they're becoming more widely advertised. Um, I know I heard on the news last week that you can uh, get an antibody test while you grocery shop. How reliable are these antibody tests and how should they be used? I don't mind jumping in. Go yeah, ahead. there's there's two kinds of antibodies. There's IgM antibodies and there's IgG antibodies. IgM antibodies generally tell you if you have an acute infection. So within the first week or 10 days or so of infection, uh, you would potentially test positive for IgM antibodies. IgG antibodies come later. And so that would more likely indicate a previous infection or exposure to the virus. So it depends on why you're using the test. If you're using it because you have symptoms, it would be important to know what kind of antibodies they're testing for because an IgG test would not tell you if you currently had an infection or most likely would not. Um, an IgG test would tell you that you have had the infection at some point and had an immune response. An IgM test would tell you if you uh, are likely to currently have an infection or exposure. Okay. And I would just add to that that you know really we don't recommend uh, antibody testing at all at this time in terms of diagnostics or you know really determining. Um, it's a useful tool for understanding the prevalence of infection in uh, in a population. Um, it's also great for things like um, you know testing blood samples to find out if you've got individuals that are eligible for donating convalescent uh, serum. So. Really, um, there, there is, a, is there use for antibody tests, it, but it's really not right now in diagnostics. We may, we may come along with that, but right now stick with the, the PCR tests and, 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 and the antigen tests where appropriate. Yeah. yeah, and one thing to add on to that, you know, I've heard of some people, well, I'm gonna get t antibody tested, then I know I've had it and I don't have to worry about anything. Right. So I don't think we wanna use it for that either, the same, because I still think we don't know, even if you've had it, could you still carry the virus and transmit it to someone else from exposure? So you still need to be wearing masks, you still need to be doing the distancing and washing your hands, whether you're antibody positive or not. And uh, the next question covers that again. So uh, we all know mask wearing is going to be imperative this winter. There have been studies on mask, wear, mask styles. Does it matter what is recommended this winter? Well, I think it does matter the type of mask. In Wisconsin, it needs to probably be warm too. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, you know, really what you're trying to do is protect other people from, you know, respiratory particles that come out from you breathing or coughing. So tight fit around the nose, around the cheek, so that air doesn't come out or escape out or it gets filtered coming out. So that's kind of what you want. And, you know, if you have that metal piece that bends around your nose so it can fit tightly there, fits around the cheeks, I really is the most protective mask that, that there is. Um, you know, I see some people that have that little valve on it, so it makes it easier for them to breathe and breathe out. That doesn't provide nearly the protection for people around you because now that air is just going right out that valve and can, those droplets can make that good distance and, and increase the spread. So, you know, tight fitting, good, good layers to filter the air coming out, filter out those droplets are the best type of mask to wear. Perfect. All right, I think that's all that we have time for today, but I just wanted to thank all three panelists one last time for being here. This isn't a cheerful topic, but it's such an important one, and I can't thank you enough for sharing some of your wisdom and some hard truths with us today. I hope everyone will make plans to join us for the next Healthy Fox Cities panel discussion, which will be happening next Thursday, December 10th at noon. We'll be talking about the resources that are available in our community for personal and business assistance. We're all struggling in some way, 
and asking for help is the key to finding our way forward. So I'm really pleased about the opportunity to bring you The Road Ahead, presented by Ascension Wisconsin, again on December 10th at noon. Until then, be safe, everyone. Thanks again for helping us today and joining us as well. Thank you.